Education is the key to success. Go to school, get a job, and live a good life. That is the African dream. And Jay, is it just me or someone light to the masses? People are on these streets carrying their entire alphabet of degrees, and yet they are living hand to mouth. No one is questioning what are we learning? Why are we learning it? What is education? And what is success? Let's not forget, there is also a growing number of people with special and varying needs who do not even have access to basic education. I have to ask, is education in Africa broken? My name is Tabo Hakango to the third. Join me every week as I sit down with experts, educators, parents, and students to talk about the state of education on the African continent. It's a lot. Welcome to the Educated Africana. Hello, my name is Chulu. I am your host for today on the Educated Africana. Now, as you know, we have been speaking on the topic of, or the theme that is education on the African continent broken, yes or no? And today I'm very excited that the we are going to continue this conversation and we'll be talking about the role of government um, in education. And I have some fabulous guests who have got a, a long history of experience in the education sector in different forms. And I would love for them to just introduce themselves and then to also give us a bit of a background um, about you know, what their experience has been with education. So please help me welcome our guests, Faith and Mwansa. And I think we'll start with ladies. Mwansa, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much, Chulu. Like you rightly said, my name's uh, Mwansam Kalula Kalumbi and um, um, have been, I have a master's in education as well as a PhD in education management. And I've been lecturing at the University of Zambia for the past uh, 13 years. And um, much of my uh, scholarly interactions are in the realm of education. So I would simply label myself as an educationist. Thank you. I love that. Faith, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Faith Abiedo. I serve as executive director at the United World Colleges International, um, based in London. Uh, well, I have been a classroom teacher. I've been a curriculum developer. I have been a communications manager, I've worked in marketing, I've done a lot around education uh, over the last 15 years as well. Uh, I've worked in both private and public schools, uh, international schools as well. So I, I, I pride myself on being an education insider. Uh, I also come from a family of educators, both my dad and my mom still work in education in the 70s and, and they have done for, for four decades or more. Uh, so I think I, I was born and, and raised in the education sector and I'm now pursuing my career as well here. So hopefully I can add enough value to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so I want us to first go back into history and then we're going to work our way to what we have currently. So what do you think most African countries inherited in terms of education after colonization? So, you know, after they um, gained independence, what was it, what was the state of education? Well, Chulu, when, um, if we want to interrogate post-independence, um, educational systems in Africa, what you note are similarities among um, the Anglo colonized um, countries. We also have the French and uh, most of the common tenets you note are that most African countries inherited 
underdeveloped education systems. What do I mean? When you look at education, for example, Zambia, 1964, you'll notice that Zambia had a dual system of education. There was a system meant for the whites and the coloreds or people of color, and there was one meant for the Africans. So you find that educational facilities for the Africans were poorly developed. And if you look at those for the whites, they were well developed. They had all the facilities. So at independence, post-independence, most African countries had the task of trying to merge these two systems into one and ensure that all the good facilities which were being enjoyed by the uh, British at that time could also be enjoyed by the Africans. So the major task post-independence was to ensure that they provide an equitable kind of um, education for all Zambians specifically. And uh, the other thing you notice that at independence, the colonial masters were keen to develop the lower levels of education. They didn't mind providing education for primary education, basic education for the Africans. But you find that even at independence 1964, Zambia had no university education. So for the Africans, it was the lower levels of education, primary education, and the least what they thought they could give an African was vocational skills. So post-independence, you find that educational facilities were underdeveloped. So there was need to up um, provision, access, facilities, and more importantly, we didn't have qualified manpower to teach in our schools. At independence, you find that all the external manpower which had been brought into Northern Rhodesia then left with the colonial masters. So at that point, Zambia was faced with uh, an underdeveloped system with no teachers to manage or to teach. So at that point, we had to firstly look at the infrastructure, improve, as well as train teachers to manage these educational facilities. Yeah. Thank you, Faye. I think I'll only add to that that the legacy of colonialism uh, is multifaceted in, in many parts of the continent. On the one hand, you had a lot of missionary driven or religiously inspired schools uh, in parts of Africa, many of which still exist today, St. Stathian, St. Francis, St. God knows what else. So lots of religiously inspired schools. And many of them were modeled around the, uh, particularly with the British, modeled around the British style of education. Uh, they were considered uh, in their day the best schools uh, in parts of the continent where they were established. And many of them still retain that very strong legacy. In alignment with that, you had an infusion of uh, foreign ideologies uh, in many ways invalidating or challenging the existence or the validity of African ways of learning and ways of being. Uh, so there was partly an erosion of uh, of indigenous or traditional African ways of organizing and, and, and being in society, while also offering uh, what they perceived to be, in, in some cases, quality or superior ways of teaching and learning. Um, the legacy of that is that many of our countries, at least largely those that are inspired by either British or the French colonial rule, have followed that same trend, and many of us uh, in our older years continue to seek education from those parts of the world uh, for higher education. So we always look towards the US, the UK, France, et cetera. Um, so I think that's an enduring legacy of uh, of, colonialism, of colonialism. And the, the other side of this is that we had an infusion of individuals from those parts of the world into our countries, assimilation into our societies, which has had mixed legacies. Uh, for example, with the British, when they came to Nigeria, where I grew up, they established not just primary and secondary schools, but established universities as well. And they brought in 
lecturers, professors from those foreign universities in the UK to come teach in Nigeria. Uh, that is a mixed legacy. On the one hand, there is no doubt in the access to uh, higher quality infrastructure, laboratories, et cetera, just ways of teaching that influenced and inspired others around us. Um, and, and on the flip side, many of them actually settled in our countries as well and began to export um, individuals from our countries to those countries for higher education to then bring them back in some cases to run government offices. Uh, the legacy in Nigeria would be that lots of the administrators in the era right before colonialism ended in, in Nigeria and right after colonialism was that many of them were offered scholarships out of Nigeria to go study in the UK uh, and learn public administration and learn engineering and a few other things cost free and were then invited back to staff government offices in Nigeria such that they had the capacity to lead uh, in, the, in the way the British Empire would have preferred. It's just to say this is a mixed legacy and, and there is no single way of dissecting how that era affected our countries over the last 60 years largely and even today the enduring legacy of, of that era. But we must continue to unpack as much as we can without choosing a single narrative of what that era has meant for our countries. I think I'm particularly interested with um, the curriculum that I guess we inherited. Do you, um, or I guess if you could inform us, do you know whether there's been any sort of um, reform and you know movement in thinking around what are we actually educating our people? I think as best as I can see, we have only adapted and slightly improved on or slightly changed what was the structure that we inherited. Um, again, I speak from the perspective of Nigeria and a little bit of South Africa as well, where, where I spend the most time. In Nigeria, we changed our schooling structure. We adapted what was called the 6334 you know, years of school in Nigeria, which means six years of primary school, three years of upper of, of middle school or at least secondary school and then and then six uh, three, another three years of upper secondary school or high school and then four years of university education that was taken hook line and sinker from the uk um, and the curriculums of the day were borrowed almost exactly from the uk because again the british education protectorate dictated what was to be taught in in nigerian schools and so the way the curriculums were designed were designed to match what was being taught in the UK, so we did the IGCSE or the GCSEs, which again were being taught in the UK. We did Cambridge A levels in Nigeria, for which you know had very little relevance uh, in in our country. But again, we're taking that uh, directly from the UK. Um, a lot of the university degrees and high school education, all the curriculums were built exactly like when the UK world history, just history, uh, had no relevance at all to our history, and always almost always began with the slave trade or some part that invalidated the existence and the validity legitimacy of uh, african kings and kingdoms and all that from, from that generation so there's a lot of a lot of that content still remains still today right still being taught exactly as it was designed in the 50s and 60s with slight adaptations over time they began to add african history in some bits but the number of schools that teach african history are very very limited uh, what i found actually most disappointing is that in nigeria the country where i grew up nigerian history was banned from the curriculum uh, after a number of years. And we continue to change, you know, global history, the, the history, the narrative of, of the abuser, of the colonizer, was the only history lesson being taught in schools. And I think if I'm not mistaken, only the last one or two years has history been allowed to be back on the conversation, not yet being taught in classes. So there are lots of things about the history of my own country that I have learned in one or two novels written by people who have actually been banned you know, because it would not be taught in class. Uh, uh, perhaps one of the worst episodes in Nigerian history, the, the Nigerian Civil War, that was called the Biafra War, is not spoken about in my country till today and is never taught in a class till today. So everything I know about that negative, utterly disappointing period in my country's history, I've heard through hearsay from my parents and from one person's book, which is still heavily disputed. So we don't have an official narrative of how we've arrived at where we are, because our own people don't teach our own history. So it's just a way of seeing how our minds have been conditioned to think in particular ways because of the influence of these foreign bodies. Um, lots to say, really, but I think the, the summary for me is that 
we've only made slight adaptations from what was introduced and then imposed on us, and that is a shame. Monza, what's your experience? When, uh, if we take time to interrogate our education system, particularly Zambia, you notice that it is actually a reflection of the British system, educational system. I'll give you an example of the structural demarcations. We still retain the seven years of primary education, five years of a secondary education, and four, two, three years of a tertiary education. And when it comes to the content, the curriculum, you find that as much as we've tried to, we've made efforts to make the curriculum relevant to our needs over the years, but the aspect of returning that elitist or kind of class demarcation when it comes to specializations, I must say, where what I mean is when you look at the British masters, they reserved certain, like I already indicated, higher education like university education for the whites and the vocational skills were supposed to be done by the Africans. So it created a kind of elitist kind of education. The white collar jobs and the Africans carried that with them. To be educated, one has got to work in an office. And as Zambia, as Africa, we've really struggled with that. And it is at that point that over the years, over the decades, we've just failed to provide an education which is practical and relevant to our needs as societies. And I'll give you an example of Zambia. The past two years, with the coming in of our new president, I think he's been emphasizing on the need for us to include relevant subject areas. Can we stop talking about the prairies of Canada? I mean, of what relevance are they to us? Why don't we talk about Zambia's climatic conditions, the types of farming which would fit which would make us grow our own food. Why don't we talk about trade? We have so much in terms of natural resources, minerals. Why don't we tailor our curriculum towards such specializations? And we are at a point where we are saying, we, from the colonial masters, we were made to believe, we were schooled to believe that if you get educated, you have to work in an office. Fields such as farming are not for us, are not for the educated. So in the end, you find that where our focus should have been over the years, we should have had well-developed agricultural systems. We have the land, we have the manpower, but we don't have the manpower with the needed skills. It's sad that 50, 60 years down the road, we are still struggling to find our feet as to what should be contained in our curricula. So I guess I'll follow that up with why are we struggling? Why is it that, you know, 60 years down the line plus there's still no, um, I guess, will or it just, there hasn't been much of a, a change? Partly. It's uh, the understanding how we framed education the minute or the moment we were introduced to it. Zambia became a British protectorate in 1924. We were made to embrace this new form of education, Western type of education. And it came with the understanding that it created an elitist kind of society. White collar jobs are for the elite. And in this case, it were the whites, our colonial masters. 
they get a degree, they get this higher education, they should work in an office. If you have to, for, the, for an African, the least you can give them is a vocational skill. They need to be given limited education in order for us to manage them. Sadly, that legacy, that kind of, there's the white collar jobs, there's the blue collar jobs. And we still return and still maintain that mindset where we want to believe that higher education, somebody gets a university degree, they're supposed to be working behind um, a well-stocked table. They're supposed to have a white collar job. And in that thinking, we've negated room for us to actually grow our own, become entrepreneurs per se. All that we, our children, we, 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 from university, all that they want to get is a job in the public sector. We now, we are now at a point where we're saying jobs, governments, the population has grown over the years. Can we nurture a population where we are going to inculcate in our children to start thinking outside the box? When you get that university degree, you should be thinking of setting up businesses. I guess we've seen a lot of uh, initiatives in our Zambian economy. They're trying to encourage entrepreneurship. And this is exactly what the president's tone has been. Can we start thinking outside the box? So in so saying, we are saying, can we dismantle this colonial legacy of attaching higher education to white collar jobs? And this is why you find uh, um, most uh, scholars say, you know, why should we be talking about, well, we, we want to talk about Booker T, we want to talk about Langston Hills, um, American literature. Why can't we teach our children how to become great farmers. If you call our own, our children, you talk about, for example, farming, it's something that they scornfully shun. They want you to be talking about being a director in this big office and, you know, that's success. So we really need to decolonize our minds. We need to nurture a generation which is going to see value in actually being creative, in becoming more practical, you know, you should, we should be walk, able to walk into, I think you've seen what's happening. If you look at Copper Belt University, we are having a lot of these, uh, you know, um, new creations. That's what we want to be seeing more. Instead of just having to read these theories and understand what the other shows about, talked about human capital theory. We want to be more practical, come up with initiatives that are going to grow an African child, a Zambian child, a Nigerian child, make them relevant and practical in their society. So we need to break that colonial kind of thinking where we only attribute education to white collar jobs. I think that has been partly one of the reasons why we've lagged behind, yeah. Um, Faith, I do want to ask you something because, you know, we've been told that, um, you know, education is the key to success, right? So, you know, you have people that um, they've gone down that route, they've gotten educated, but, you know, right afterwards, the success is not coming. You know, you've got people with PhDs, with masters and so on, and so many degrees that are just not thriving. They're working in um you know in in jobs or, or not working at all when you talk about the unemployment level so i mean from what once i said in saying that you know we need to decolonize our minds we need to start thinking about how can we make things more practical i think i i, I feel that we are kind of really holding on to how do we stay um assimilated or how do we say as, sim as stay as similar as possible to the education systems of the West. 
So there's kind of like a, a tension there. So how can that be resolved in terms of us coming up with our own practical things, but then at the same time, having to hear Western people not accept, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, what we call or think as, as what our people should be learning. Does, does my question make sense? Uh, yeah. No, it's 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 a brilliant question to be honest because I, I think I'll I'll carry in exactly from where Moansa actually finished off. The very premise of what an education makes possible needs to be rethought. In the earlier days, and especially the colonial era that we we're refer referring to earlier, there was a promise attached to going to school. And the promise attached to going to school was you will get a job. So that was the incentive to leave the farm leave the construction sites, go get a school because it qualifies you for a higher quality job with the promise of more pay and dignity. So people went to schools knowing that when they were done, there was a factory to go work in or there was uh, an office to work in the civil service or some other kind of, of employment promise on the back end of that. Now, over time, the number of people who are requiring those services continues to increase, but the access to those services decreases. So the frustration builds and people saying, I've gone to school, where is the job? Either in the private sector or in the public sector, You, I mean, I, I came up with a consciousness, you will do your part. And my part is to be diligent in school. Now, if we know market forces, supply and demand always go hand in hand. You need to ensure that there's as much supply for the demand. Now we have an oversupply of people who have gone to school and then an undersupply uh, of accessible options for, for, for employment. Now, we know that governments by themselves will never solve the unemployment crisis across our continent. Governments don't have enough spaces for all the PhD grads to get a job, for all the master's grads to get a job. And so people began to pursue higher order qualifications because historically there was a level of employment or jobs you can have with a primary-based education and a slightly higher level of job for masters for, for secondary-based education and a higher job for the undergrad degree, a bachelor's degree, and then a master's degree, a PhD. But we've all bought into an, a false mindset that the higher qualifications, the more accessible jobs will be to you, which is why you have PhD grads saying, well, I got the PhD, there's nothing more to earn. Where is the job? But the market hasn't provided enough jobs. Now, what Mwansa was referencing here is how do we reframe education as, as I think, the enlightenment of the mind, an introduction to society and all it has to offer, and uh, visibility of opportunities for individual creation. Not all of us will work in the public sector. There are just not enough jobs to go around. Not all of us will work in the organized private sector. Hopefully, we keep creating more and more and finding ways to employ more people. A lot of us have to be self-driven entrepreneurs. Each one must find a way to connect their individual abilities and the newly acquired skills towards opportunities to do something. Now, the least likely to hire people should be the public sector in any country. As our populations grow, just how many government offices can there be? There won't be enough room for everyone to, to get a job in the public sector. So that era has changed where the promise was to get an education and come and work in the government ministry of you know, justice. You can be a clerk. There's not enough options for that. So my biggest challenge right now, and if I link it right back to that, that, that earlier question that you'd asked, which is why are things not changing? I think the reason things are not changing is because we have splintered out society. The elite don't go to the government-run schools. So there's less of an incentive. There's a pathway for the elite to find their own way. If you dial back all the way to the 30s and 40s and 50s, everyone went to the government-run schools because there were only that many of them. And even then, the elite were being plucked out of the villages to go to those government-run schools in other cities. That's where the elite went. Over time, as quality diminished, private schools began to spring up. And then international schools began to spring up on the back of that. So you have your private national schools, your private international schools, and what was left, the government-run schools for the masses. And unfortunately, when you entrust anything to the to the public, to the government to run, it tends to just not have the same quality. So everyone who can find their way 
out of the country or into a private school settles for the publicly designed education, which is where you still learn Booker T. Washington and, and all the rest of them that will never actually change. So we, we haven't found a way to infuse the same quality that has now seeped out of public schools into the private. We haven't found a way to bring that right back into public education. So unfortunately, the vast majority of, of us in society, the bottom billion, are going to government-run schools where nothing would ever change. Unfortunately, the way the, and the, the trends, the way the trends are, things don't change quickly enough. So my hope is that those of us who have some measure of influence on education systems find ways to exchange knowledge between what is private education and, and, and public education, access to, the, to new ways of thinking, and also think very creatively about how to democratize access, especially for those who are looking for free education or low-cost education. High quality is not always low-cost, and that's a huge challenge because government budgets don't match the need. So I'm really hoping that all of us who have some measure of influence can help with the transference of, of knowledge and access to resources, but this is going to be a huge challenge huge challenge not everyone can go to private schools um and that's where you see more quality these days so let's imagine a world where you know all things are fair and uh governments are able to african governments specifically are able to you know figure out uh this is what we want to be educating our people you know this is our history um you know so on and so forth and this is practical information do you think that an education that is created by Africans is going to be acceptable off the continent? I think so. I think what we know for sure is that African citizens are resilient, we're extremely intelligent, we can create homegrown solutions for ourselves. And there are lots of comparable experiences in other industries that show that we are beginning to design homegrown solutions that actually match what is authentic to us. Again, learning history, learning literature. It's no reason for us to be learning Shakespeare and Tess of the Dubbervilles and everything else that actually has no relevance to, to our local environment. And the prairies, I don't even know what a prairie looks like because we don't talk about the savannah and all that stuff in, in where we've come from. So there are lots of ways in which we can, it's possible not just for African pride, but to really design what is authentic for people who are learning. Because as you are learning, when the words that are being used don't actually reflect how you learn. I'll give you a very practical example. In, in secondary school, I wasn't great at economics. I loved the subject, but I wasn't great at economics. And when I got to university, actually, when I was finishing university, I began to realize that one of the reasons I wasn't actually understanding what was being taught were the words that were, that were being used. For example, an economic story would say something about the marginal utility of blah, blah, blah. I don't know what marginal utility means because we don't speak that way. What is marginal utility? But if someone says the added value of something, ah, no, I get that, right? Why are you speaking in all this jargon that probably is textbook language? So every time there was a mathematical formula on the marginal utility of blah, 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 I kept thinking, I just don't know what is being said. It's because that's not how we speak. That's not how we communicate. That's how perhaps the British used to teach their children and they all understood utility because utility was common language. For us, it wasn't. That's just a slight example of ways in which we've missed the chance to tailor to our own communities and the languages that appeal to us. So folks like me grew up thinking, I can't be good at economics. But I actually wonder if the teacher who was teaching me understood it themselves. Because why would they just not say, in other words, you can call this the added value? Or the extra benefit. They kept giving me the same textbook language. So I'm thinking, you probably memorized that stuff and you've just assumed that that's how to teach it, you know? So I really believe that there's a reorientation that we can own and there's pride that we can take in what we can create and then speak to people in languages and tones that matter to them, that actually reflect the environments in which they live. It can be accepted. But it's going to take a while. I think it's still a longer while for us to believe that we are not in competition with the West or with the, with the rest of the world. Therefore, if we don't match what they're doing, we're substandard. It's going to take a while. We can do the work. But I really would be looking to a lot of African education leaders to step back 
and align what we do in schools, the direction of our countries. What are the what are the right um, what are the right ambitions for our countries, and and how do we enable educational delivery to be directly correlated to our ambitions? Right. What does it? What do our countries really need? If we see that our value is heavy on 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 natural minerals, on agriculture, on on manufacturing, etc. I would hope that the ways in which we orient our children as they come up through school, one offers them a baseline level of skills of learning literacy and numeracy. It's, that's, that's just non-negotiable. Every child must grow up with basic literacy and numeracy and then begin to help them organ organize the rest of their own learning towards the needs of the country. We have abundant arable land. Agriculture has immense promise, not just because we can go farm and and hopefully feed our own families but because we can actually trade up heavily and be leaders in that industry training people for for office jobs when they're just not enough of them is counterproductive when we abandon what it is that we actually great at so i think there's a lot of work to this hope that it can be done uh, it won't just happen overnight uh, and we have to it's a national development or continental development initiative that will attract us to reorganize education to meet our ambitions Otherwise, we're just offering what has always been offered, thinking at least something is better than nothing, right? Which is the approach I think we've taken to education. At least teach them math and English and hopefully, knock on wood, something is going to happen. Hope is not a strategy, right? But what we've done has been hopefully something works in the future. Once you finish school, hope you can figure it out. And that's what has disappointed me the most, that we haven't been strategic. We're way too hopeful about what might change. Why is that? I, I, I like um, thought patterns as Faith is putting it. I think what, what he's really trying to say is we've we, we, we've been in this quagmire post independence. If you look at the political, philosophical underpinnings of most African countries what we had was socialism we had ujama in tanzania we had harambe in kenya we had humanism in zambia our post-colonial leaders embraced this colonialism and it trickled down to the way we looked at what an education system should do or should be there for because always believe me a well-consolidated education system must and should be a reflection of the society it's meant to serve. And post-independence, you find that Dr. Kaunda, Jomo Kenyatta, they made efforts. They were really trying to ensure that they have an education which would serve the aspirations of the African people through socialism and you see socialism by nature was able to provide that opportunity or that window for us to actually align our education systems to our needs for example in zambia we had what we are calling zambianization remember i mentioned for example in education we had no teachers all those expatriates who remained, we started sending away, sending them away. We wanted to train our own. We wanted to give our own Zambian people all the big jobs, train them and give them these big positions. So with socialism, it really provided that window for us to have adopted an education which would be befitting to our African needs. In the long run, as we were trying to do that, in the case of Zambia, by the time we got to the 1980s, we started experiencing economic woes. So in a socialist state where the government needs to fuse in, needs to provide all the financial human resources, it became difficult. What choice were we left with? By the time we got to the 90s, 1991, we saw Zambia become a democracy. That changed everything. What we had now was a liberalized kind of education. In the midst of that liberalization, we've uh, 
signed a number of international treaties where we are saying we are now living in a global village and even the education that we provide should be tailored in such a way. So now African governments are torn in between. There's the aspect of having to train a Zambian or a citizen who's going to fit in the, in the global village. And there's, the, there's also the needs. Can we train a Zambian who's going to fit into our Zambian society? So we are at the crossroads. Which way do we take? And what disadvantages most African countries as we look at these educational priorities is the fact that we are like face said, we don't have the needed resources to invest in our education systems. And that has made us have in inverted commas misplaced priorities. Because for those who are willing to provide this help, they'll come with their own priorities. We have bilateral, multilateral partners. They'll come with their own priorities. For us, we want, I'll give you a practical example. 2013, Zambia adopted a new curriculum framework where we acknowledged that we need to have two pathways. There's the vocational and the academic. But you find that, Yes, we have a well-modeled curriculum towards achieving that. But you find that when it comes to the needed investment, the resources needed, we are always lacking. And in the case of Zambia, for a good 10 years, you saw the budgetary allocation in, in education reduce. So that meant it became difficult even to achieve. You, I'll give you an example of uh, I, ICT. It was a newly introduced uh, subject area. You go into a public school in these rural areas, you find that they don't even have a computer. And this is like 10 years down the road. So what I'm simply trying to say is that as much as we struggle in providing educational needs for our people, an education which is going to be befitting or responsive to the needs of, uh, for example, the Zambian society. We also have this wider voice, louder voice, coming from the global Western, usually. These are uh, initiatives which are driven by the most powerful, su such that even when they want to provide help at that bilateral level, they'll only invest in what is relevant to them. Not, is what, not what is relevant to us. So already, even at that point, we're always struggling. So the, the other issue which makes it so difficult for us to really tell our education system to what we want, how we want it to be, to meet our aspirations as a Zambian society, as an African continent, lies in our lack of resources. Our partners will come and they'll definitely, in a subtle way, Tell us this money can only be invested in this. We want you to train your teachers in this manner. If you can't do it, we are going back with our money. What choice are you left with? Now what we have is disjointed kind of projects. You find that when you what you really need are well-trained teachers, primary school teachers, that's where the deficit is. You find that those with the monies come with a pure school level where you don't even need to train more. Are you saying that? So in the end, it really becomes so difficult. It's been so hard for us to really tell her and our line, align our education to our needs as an African society. I think as we are winding down, I would love to hear from you. What are key areas that need to be addressed, um, especially, you know, when we're talking about education, whether it's the curriculum, the structure, what, what, are the, what are key areas that are just not even being talked about at this point? Well, <laughs> Grace, you go can ahead. come. You want me to go? All right. This is, this is multifaceted and, and, 
and you begin to lean, lean on that one so i think that there is a huge conversation that is bigger than education in itself it's about resource constraints we can't compare ourselves with other parts of the world where there's just a lot of resources at play that influence how a government divvies up its budget on an annual basis but let's even take the divvying up of a budget the UN, the World Bank, recommend about 20 to 25% of a country's budget should go towards education. When you come into education in itself, you have to look at various levels. There's access, there is quality generally, there is continuous development, and a few other indices, equity, equality, etc., that, that you have to focus on. When you look at access by itself, are we getting every child into school? And are we offering them at least the bare minimum? To be able to read and write and, and progress over time to have self knowledge self independence etc that metric is not being met largely across the continent it's just an access for you to address access you need to have schools within easy reach preferably within 10 to 15 minutes walk or, or drive for of every child anywhere in any country that is the further you are from city centers the lesser the chances are the young people can access schools that's just very simple. We're far from doing that. Now, it means that we're leaving behind a significant population, a segment of our population every single year, and that's a travesty, but that's number one. When you come into quality in itself, we've talked a bit about curriculum, uh, but more importantly, it's teacher development um, and who are the people who are being entrusted with the development of the next generation. Uh, growing up in Nigeria, the only people who went to colleges of education or teacher training colleges are people who did not score high enough grades to go to university, right? In essence, people who are not able to learn <laughs> properly are being entrusted with developing other people. That's a joke, right? That's a joke. I can't get my mind over it. Assuming you 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 take the exams out of a score of 400, if you score 200 and above, you can go to university. If you score 100 to 120, you go become a teacher right so it's like you can't pass math therefore go teach others how to pass math and and i just couldn't really wrap my head around that reality but that that's a joke and when you compare with other parts of the world very likely we, we often look at like finland as like the go-to for education because they figured this whole thing out uh, the minimum requirement to be a primary school teacher in finland is a master's degree right and that obviously comes not just with you know, you've got a master's degree, you've got a job. There's dignity that accompanies that role. You're well compensated. Uh, you're, the infrastructure in, in, in which you're going to teach is well organized. Uh, you have all your benefits linked to that. Your classrooms are well stocked. You know, that by itself just reflects society as a whole. It means there's enough to go around. In our case, we're really going for low cost, bare minimum. How can we still survive? Um, so I really would focus at, at that infrastructural element of what are the schools that we're actually setting up who are the people that we are developing and entrusting with the responsibility for the next generation and how do we democratize access if we can take one or two of those i think we're on the way and then further down the line we can begin to innovate on top of that but at the very least leave no child behind at the very least prepare compensate and equip the teachers who go into classrooms, even in remote areas. And then thirdly, please give us chairs to sit on, give us textbooks to use, give us paper to, to write, and if you can give us computers, they're just some bare minimums that largely through government-driven education, we haven't even begun to solve yet. Um, and and I don't I don't think we, we have to sacrifice one for the other. We have to really pursue both tracks. We can really innovate at the level of high quality curriculum development, monitoring evaluation for teachers, all that stuff, we can do that while also going for the bottom of society. But it's a lot of work and it requires a lot of budget and a lot of motivation, commitment to this. Um, I hope we can get it right in our generation, but this, this is a huge, huge task to, to pursue. Yeah, like uh, Faith has said, I think we generally need to firstly increase budgetary allocation to our education system. And we just need to up our game when you look at the basic ingredients, like he's rightly said, teacher education, infrastructural development, the teaching and learning materials, all those are dynamics. 
are aspects which need to a lot more investment because in whatever education system you are in, there is always this nexus. Quality and quantity, which one are you ready to trade off? And across Africa, we've always been ready to trade off the quality aspect. I'll give you an example. Look at what's happening in Zambia. We are on a very good steady ground right now. The past two years, we've seen so many improvements, teacher recruitment, access increase. And what we have right now is a very good problem. We have all the children in our public schools. The role and the government's target right now should be to increase teacher recruitment, invest in infrastructure more especially, to reduce on the pupil teacher ratio. If we follow through on this trajectory, five, 10 years from now, we'll be talking about a different education system in Zambia. And already we're making efforts to see how we can improve our curriculum. If we can steadily follow through on that path, I think we'll be talking about a different Zambia in the next five, 10 years. Okay, okay, thank you so much. I think this has been a great conversation. Do you have any final thoughts, any final words that you want to share? And yeah. I think in as much as what we have shared in this conversation is a reflection of more of the challenges and the complexity of transforming our education, I really want to just pay tribute to everyone who's trying in spite of the difficulties and the challenges to move the needle in certain areas. Uh, there are lots of projects that are identifying and preparing teachers to go into really difficult areas to go you know, deliver education to people. Um, the Teach for All movement globally has lots of you know, partner organizations, Teach for Uganda, Teach for Kenya, Teach for Nigeria. And largely they're sending uh, young people uh, with a bit of training into uh, largely under-resourced areas to go deliver what is the best quality education they can offer. And, and organizations like that and many others uh, that are local, some international, uh, lots of players are working in spite of government and sometimes with governments to try to make a difference at that level. So for me, it's just really to recognize that it's always easier to, to, to see the challenges and to see the complexity and why it's just so hard to get there. Uh, but folks aren't giving up. Um, and I want to encourage everyone who's able to make a difference locally within their own sphere of influence to go for it. Education is the way society revolves itself so we transform ourselves. And so if we don't invest in education, we don't grow as a society. Um, and it's the reason I've committed my life to education and I keep doing as much as I can to influence, support, encourage every player in the field at any level. And I hope that more, more people will join the, the cause of being solutions providers. We won't all have high fancy jobs in different parts of the world. Some of us have to be in the trenches. Uh, and, and I hope that those who are brave enough to do that will find encouragement from the rest of us as well. So thanks for convening the conversation and uh, and hearts off to you as well and, and others who are creating space for dialogue and, uh, and some interventions. And uh, may we make a difference in our own time. Mwansa, your final words? Really, we can make the difference we want to see. And, um, you know, the greatest investment, any country, those countries which have developed has been the ability to invest in their people. And that can only be done through a relevant education. If we make efforts like most African countries are doing, we make efforts to ensure that we infuse the correct skills relevant, the, the, the catch word there is relevant, infuse relevant skills and uh, values in our people. And that we can only do through education. If we get to that realization, I think we'd be able to see a lot of wonders. And uh, the other thing we need to really think through is what is the relevance of education? What do we, how do we, what is our understanding of one getting an education? We need 
a deconstruction of whatever it is that we've had over the decades. And uh, I, I think the, I, I, I would always talk about Zambia and have been an educationist. And on the, uh, on the other hand, I was a pew pew in the different eras of uh, political systems in our country. And what I'm noticing now, what I've noted is that I think with political will, a lot can be done. Because right now we have a government which has shown that willingness to invest big in education. They've, they're at a point where they have appreciated the power that lies in providing quality education to its citizens. And, and if we can have that kind of mindset across African leaders, I think we'll be looking at a different Africa in the next 10, 20 years. So really, we can do it, and we should always acknowledge that we won't be able to change anything as long as we provide wrong education to our citizens. Thank you so much, Chulu. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Faith, thank you, Mwansa. This has been a conversation on the role of government in education. And whilst it is not exhausted, we shall continue and um, certainly hope that whoever listens to this, you know, whatever influence you have, that you can make an impact that is positive on the continent. This has been The Educated Africana. My name is Chulu and thank you so much for listening. Be part of the solution. Talking is not enough. We need action. So I am challenging you today. What are you going to do about what you just heard? Tell us all about it on social media. Tag at Africana Women or hashtag Educated Africana. The Educated Africana is part of the Africana Women podcast network. Subscribe, review, and share this episode to help us keep the conversation going. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram at Africana Woman or hashtag Educated Africana. Catch you next week.